taking the week off there at the beach right now, so uh, I'm here to do the message. All right, okay, well, welcome to those who are joining us online. Uh, we've had some great time of worship, and we just believe God's going to really touch those that were prayed for uh, in, in the area of healing. We just want to believe that because I think, uh, you know, the word of knowledge was there to, and the, the leading of the Lord, and now he wants to touch it with our faith so that we can uh, see the actual manifestation of the healing. So let's believe. Those that were prayed for, let's believe that God is going to bring uh, great healing into those issues. So I know I could use healing in both the lameness and the vision. So I'm receiving, though I was praying, I'm receiving, I'm, I'm believing for it as well. Um, so anyway, welcome everybody. A um, couple of announcements uh, uh, I want to make. I want to just say thanks for all the great support of the uh, emphasis, or the life school emphasis. We had a goal for our spring initiative of uh, $25,000, and we're probably, I think we're a couple thousand short. So I want to give, especially any online as well, uh, the opportunity to give if you'd like to so that we could get to that goal. But we just really, really appreciate your doing that. If you haven't given yet and you want to, especially those that may be watching online, uh, just uh, give.lifeschoolinternational.com. Uh, dot org. You could give there. And uh, uh, so it's going great with uh, the, the pastors in Africa. We're really having a great uh, uh, time of ministry there. We're, we're discipling and mentoring uh, them uh, in the Forerunner School material. And it's really, I think it's bringing really great transformation in these 23 or so uh, men and one woman that is on the team there. And I really believe it's going to go where it'll make a huge impact, not only there, but also to the thousands of pastors there in these 10 nations. So anyway, we're, uh, we're really excited about that. And uh, anyway, just thanks so much for that. And, and then one other quick announcement is that there won't be any prayer uh, this week because of the spring break. Uh, all right, so let me just, uh, let me pray, and then we'll just... Uh, begin the teaching today. Father, we thank you for this message. I ask that you would take me out of the way. I know it is an important word for your church. So we ask that we would have focus and that you would be the, you would be the speaker. Take me out of the, the midst of this and you take control. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Well, this is, in, in a, this is session 15, uh, actually, of our um, Theology of the Bride class. This concludes this, but I think it's also a very important message for those of us who are here uh, today. Uh, you know, Randall kind of touched on it during the worship about this being Palm Sunday and on the day that uh, Palm Sunday is celebrated, uh, we see it starting in Matthew chapter 21 where Jesus came into, the, into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Uh, he came in there and he went, to, uh, he, he went to the temple first. He cleansed the temple. He healed the lame. He healed uh, the blind. Uh, and then, of course, that last week, uh, he came as the Passover lamb. He was sacrificed on Passover and resurrected on the Feast of First Fruits as our Savior and our Lord. There's so much depth there you could go into as we celebrate this on Palm Sunday. There's so much you could do. But I want to focus on a couple of things uh, here. I mean, there's a lot that I want to talk about. But the message that I'm teaching is uh, beginning the journey toward bridal readiness, beginning the journey toward bridal readiness. Uh, and I want to just begin by just focusing on two triumphant entries. If you go to Revelation chapter 19, starting with verse 11, you see, and I won't turn to a lot of these scriptures because there's enough, enough uh, several that I will have to turn to. But if you look at Revelation 19, verse 11, you see that Jesus is returning. 
at his second coming. And he's coming uh, riding on a white horse. And he's coming with a, a, a group of people following him. Uh, it's the bride made ready, the call, the chosen, the faithful. It's the, uh, those who are dressed in fine linen, bright and clean, myriads of angels, and the bride who is made ready come with him. That triumphant entry is really a twofold uh, type of entry. It's the entry of a triumphant king. You know, when the Roman soldiers would uh, come back to Rome after their conquest, the general would ride on a white horse, and he would ride into, uh, into Rome under the archways, triumphant with all the, the bounty that he had taken uh, from, uh, from the place that they had conquered. So in a sense, it's a, this, what Jesus is portraying is that he is the triumphant king who will return. But it's all the, also the entry of the bridegroom coming with his bride, coming back to Jerusalem where, they, where they will he will establish his throne and the marriage supper of the Lamb will take place. That's what we have to look forward to, and that's really what is coming really before us even right now in the very near future, I believe, that Jesus will come back triumphant, triumphant. But then there's this other triumphant entry that we're celebrating today that the world celebrates called Palm Sunday where Jesus came into Jerusalem riding this time on a donkey. He riding on a donkey to the, to the hosannas of all the people celebrating and honoring his presence. He came with humility. He came this time with an invitation. When he comes a second time, it won't be an invitation. It'll be a triumphant entry of those who have made themselves ready. But in this first entry, when he comes on the donkey, he's coming in humility, a beast of humility, and three themes seem to emerge with his coming. In this week, in this Matthew chapter 21 through 28, three themes seem to come forth. One, be alert. Two, be found so doing. You see that in Matthew uh, 24. Also in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, be found so doing. And, and the invitation, this is what I want to focus on primarily today, the invitation to make ourselves ready. He called three themes. You know, he comes with an invitation. He cleanses the temple. And all this has symbolism to the Passover celebration. But he comes with this invitation to be alert, to be found so doing, and to, be, and to make ourselves ready. And in the context of make ourselves ready, there is an invitation to make ourselves ready as a bride made ready for Christ. We see that in Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. We see it in Matthew uh, 22. We see it in a general, more general sense in Matthew chapter 24. So he wants us to be alert. He wants us to be focused on making ourselves ready. One word about alertness. I'm not going to talk about alertness today, but about being alert. But if you look at the, the church at Sardis and the, going to, now to, to John's messages in the book of Revelation, if you look at the church at Sardis and you see it says, wake up. Uh, you know, because if you don't, I'll come like a thief. That same, that word, wake up, there, is the same word in the Greek as be alert, be on the alert in, in this section of Matthew 21 uh, through 25 or, or 6. And so the alertness, this is, a word, this is really an important word, I believe. The, the, the alertness is not just so we'll know what's going on but it's alertness unto readiness. Because if you look at Sardis, he says, wake up or be, be on the alert because you're not ready. 
So he connects it with readiness there. And you know, we're, we have a lot of things going on in the world right now. Who would, who would admit or agree that we have a lot of things going on in the world right now? I mean, I'm, I haven't seen the world in such turmoil really in my life. And it's easy to get focused on alert to this issue going on, alert to the monetary issues that are going on, alert to the war in Russia and the Ukraine, alert to what China's going on, doing. And, and it's good to be alert to those things. But I, what I've seen, of, and not maybe so much here, but what I've seen, especially maybe some online, is we get alert, we get focused on all these things that are going on, but they don't filter into readiness. They don't filter into readiness. They just say, oh man, this is happening. Oh, this is happening. Oh, this is happening. You know, the Lord's going to come back soon. But we forget, what we forget is the Lord is saying, because of all this, get ready. That's the overriding thing. Be ready, be ready, be ready. Now let's look at, I want to look at uh, bridal readiness now in that context of the importance of bridal readiness because it's the bride who has made herself ready who will be in this triumphant processional coming at the end of the age. And I don't know about you. I think I do know about you really. I think you want to be a part of that and I want to be a part of that. We want that. Can you imagine how exciting it will be to be riding on a white horse along with Christ on a white horse as the battle of Armageddon takes place? Now, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to be at that battle without him, but with him in his triumphant glory uh, defeating the en his enemies and our enemies and triumphantly entering into to Jerusalem, setting up his throne in the land there. And us being with him. I want to be a part of that. But the ones who will be a part of that is the bride who has made herself ready. Because we see, we see that the, the verse of Scripture, we see that the verse of Scripture that triggers the second coming is about two verses prior to this triumphant entry of Christ coming in. It's Revelation, starts with Revelation. 19, verse 7. <clears throat> and I want to make a couple of points about it before we go into some other things. Let me just read it. Revelation 19, verse 7. Let us rejoice and be glad and give, the, and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come. That's the consummation marriage of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Let me just read it, then I want to make a couple of comments about it. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then he said to me, these are true words of God. And I think when the, when the Lord says this to us, these are true words of God. They certainly are words that we need uh, to heed. Now let me let me uh, make a few points here. That you, really, you could go word by word, and they, they, it's a rich meaning. But I don't want to take the time to do all of that. But but the bride, the one that'll be the eternal wife of the Lamb, married to Him throughout of eternity, has made herself ready. So what does this say to us? We, it says that there is a personal responsibility that each and every one of us have to make ourselves ready. We have a personal assignment. So we can be alert, but the alert, alertness is under readiness. The bride who, has made her, who will be in this processional has made herself ready. There's a personal responsibility to do that, and it's beyond, way beyond it's way beyond just being born again. And we'll deal with some of the issues there. The bride has made herself ready. 
It was given to her to clothe herself. Okay, I want that, that given. You know, when you first hear read that, it sounds like okay, the bride was given an assignment to make herself ready. Well, that's not really the meaning of that word, uh, even though she has been given an assignment. It's really more the bride was granted wedding garments as a result of the bride making herself ready. So there's, there's two points there, and th these are both important. There's nothing we can do to put bridal garments on ourselves. Only God can give us the bridal garments. Only God can, can clothe us in the fine linen, the bridal garments. But we have a personal responsibility to do it, to make ourselves ready. So kind of a twofold objective there. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, fine linen. Let me talk about fine linen. This is really important because if you look at the sons of Zadok and some of the other places uh, where it talks about the priesthood, to go into the presence of the, of the Lord, into the Holy of Holies, the priests have to be clothed in fine linen. So the fine linen there, we need to be clothed at the end of the age with fine linen. We need to be clothed with linen garments because those are the priestly garments that will allow us to enter in, etern in eternity into the presence of God to be able to minister unto him. We need those fine garments. And the bride who has made herself ready is the one who will be clothed in that fine linen, the priestly garments. I want to be a part of the, the priestly bride who will be able to, to minister unto the Lord throughout all of eternity, and I know you do as well. So there's a call to readiness uh, that, is, that is associated with that. Let me just do one more phrase here. The fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Uh, now, that word righteous acts is one word in the Greek. It's not, and so it's not like, I always use this example. Uh, Brian and I kind of tease each other. He always uses the example of cutting grass or painting, and I don't think he's cut his grass in five years, really. He's got to hire somebody to do it. <laughs> and I don't know when the last time he painted anything, but I always use the... Uh, the, the word of, I don't want to, you know, it's not like going to the, uh, uh, to the uh, food bank and serving at the food bank. And, uh, yeah, I always use that example, um, but I, I don't think I've ever served at a food bank in my whole life. Uh, so it's not that I, we do all these things, but it does make an exa a good example. Righteous acts is not doing like works of service. Even though I'm not saying we shouldn't do works of service. We should. But that's not what it's called. It, it, what the righteous acts are, and the meaning of that word in the Greek is really just a, there's other, there's different aspects to it, but the main meaning of that word is a concrete expression of righteousness. A concrete expression of righteousness. So the one, the bride made ready who will be clothed in fine linen and who will come back with the Lord has, has put on a concrete expression of righteousness. So it's far beyond imputed righteousness as much as that's needed. We need, uh, we desperately need imputed righteousness. But the but this is not talking about justification or imputed righteousness. It's talking about our realized righteousness that comes out of our relationship of imputed righteousness. In other words, it probably relates more because John wrote all of this. Jesus gave the whole book of Revelation to John, the apostle John. It probably relates primarily to Revelation 2 and 3, to the message to the seven churches. Probably relates to Revelation 18, come out of Babylon. Probably relates to all that. Probably also relates to those uh, issues that Paul, the Apostle Paul talked about where he talked about the deeds of the flesh 
In other words, this concrete expression of righteousness is a a lifestyle of overcoming. It's an overcoming lifestyle. And so what God is saying to us is that as this triumphant entry that is ahead of us, not the one 2,000 years ago, it will happen when the bride in sufficient numbers is made ready. Clothed in fine linen, she has made herself ready, which goes down to the individual believer level with a concrete expression of righteousness. And so, when Jesus, you know, we go back to the, for a minute to the Jesus' entry on Palm Sunday or the five days before the Passover, before he went to the cross, there was an invitation for this readiness. So you see the parallel? When the bride has made herself ready, the Lord's going to come back with his bride. 2,000 years ago, he comes and he says, I'm giving you an invitation. Make yourself ready. Make yourself ready. And you see it in that week. You can look at. You can look through it. There's a lot of material in there. You can see that. Make yourself ready. He comes with an invitation, an invitation unto readiness. So, we have the church has, from the beginning of Pentecost to the Lord returns, to make herself ready as a bride. We have individually. I have. You have. We have, from the moment we're born again, till either the Lord returns or we go to meet the Lord through death to make ourselves ready. So every one of us, every one of us lives in the reality of that. So it's it's different than going to heaven. If we're born again with imputed righteousness, justified, covered by the blood, we'll go to heaven. But to be the eternal wife of the Lamb, to rule and reign with Him throughout all of eternity, whatever that means, there's a separate assignment in addition to accepting Christ. And that's to say, I want to make myself ready. So it affects each and every one of us. And this is where the alertness comes in. It's not just to be alert to say, oh man, The world's falling apart, and it seems like it is. But it's not just that. It's because it seems like we're really on the verge of the second coming of Christ. We have this invitation. Make ourselves ready. It's heavy. I know it. This is good. Seem like I've been, I get heavy messages from time to time. But anyway, but better to know now than to find out when we stand before Christ. Amen? All right. So that's the invitation. That's the invitation. He's given each and every one of us an invitation beyond salvation to make ourselves ready as a bride, to put on these fine linen garments which are the righteous, concrete expression of righteousness and to be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Not every believer will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. I don't know what, exactly what that'll be. I don't know if we'll actually eat food or we'll just partake of Christ. I don't know what it'll be, but I know enough about it to know I want to be a part of it. Amen? Amen. Okay, all right, amen. Okay, now I want, now I want to list... Uh, and I hate to even say this because you're going to say, oh no, it's going to take forever. I want to list six foundational principles that will get you started or if you're already on the journey, started on the journey toward bridal readiness or if you're already on that journey, six principles that will maybe give you a fresh jump start uh, on that journey to readiness. Now, I've got notes um, We'll get those posted online, and I can, if anybody, I, I don't know exactly how that works, but we, we have notes, and uh, we'll get them to you. 
Uh, it, so you don't have to worry too much about taking notes, but feel free to. So let's go to these six principles. Because that, over the years of, of focusing on that, the Lord has put several principles on my heart as to what really is involved in making our, ourselves ready. Uh, and these are some things that I really believe are important. The first one is the journey toward, so, so we're, we're looking just to make sure we understand. We're looking on a, at principles that will help us either begin or get jump into the journey of making ourselves ready with real focus and attention on it because that's what the Lord, I think, is saying to us in this hour. One, the journey, here's the first principle, the journey toward bridal readiness begins when we completely surrender our life to Christ. It begins when we completely surrender our life to Christ. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying this is, I'm not saying either way that this is what's required to be born again. Uh, I, I'll leave that to a different message. But I, I've seen this over the years and I'm, very, I'm, com, I'm convinced of it. We don't really begin the journey of readiness until we say to the Lord, I am yours. I am completely and totally yours. You do with me as you want. Uh, and there are a lot of people who have been born again, especially, you know, as you, you begin to see the, glo the global church and the seeker-sensitive movement and the hyper-grace movement and the prosperity gospel movement and, you know, a lot of the traditional movements. Uh, this whole idea of giving our life fully to Christ is really foreign to a lot of those movements. It's like, you know, fill out a card and say, yeah, I want to be a Christian, and there you're there a Christian. So there's a lot of people who have never really given their life to Christ, never really uh, totally surrendered their life to Christ. But, you know, there's... A, I won't turn to all these scriptures, but you know, Luke 9, 23, Jesus gives a couple in, in the gospels. Luke 9, 23, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily. You know, in other words, die to self daily and follow him. And then he goes on with, with uh, other things, but and then he ends that section of scripture with whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of him when he comes in glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So we're talking about the second coming. You know, when he comes the second time, whoever doesn't live this way, you know, he will be ashamed of them at that time. Then Luke 14, 25 through 33, you know, it's a big, it's a long section of scripture, but basically Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, You've got to put me to a point that it's almost like you hate your father, your mother, uh, your spouse, your children, even your own life. He says you've got to take up, you got to take up your cross every day to follow me. And he says you've got to give up all your possessions to follow me. So Jesus, Jesus raises up a high bar when he says to be a disciple of me You've got to do these things. But the one, the scripture I want to talk, spend a minute or two on is from the book of Ruth. Uh, I love these Old Testament types and shadows. But, you know, you look at the book of Ruth, you, you've, got, you've got Naomi, you've got Ruth, and you've got uh, uh, Naomi's other daughter-in-law, Orpah. They, they lived in Moab. Now, Moab is a place of, of compromised living. There was Chemosh was the god of Moab, a very evil god, very much opposed to uh, the, the Jewish, uh, Jewish practices of that day. But it becomes a beautiful type and shadow of the journey of Ruth from Moab to where she ultimately becomes married to her kinsman redeemer, Boaz. So it's a picture of the individual believer who lives, leaves Moab, compromised living, and ends up being married to our kinsman redeemer, Christ. Naomi is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And so Naomi wants to lead Ruth through step-by-step -step 
uh, journey to ultimately she's married uh, to her bridegroom redeemer, which is Christ. But here's what begins her journey. Ruth does not leave Moab compromise until she makes this six-fold commitment to Naomi, to, the, to a picture of the Holy Spirit. Do not urge, Ruth chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. So that's part of our commitment to the, to the Lord. If we want to be made ready as a bride, Lord, whatever you want me to do, wherever you go, I'll, I'll go. It's not just a geographical place. It's a, you know, it's a relationship. Wherever you lead me, whatever you lead me to do, I will do. That's, what, that's, uh, that's my first declaration to you. I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. Secondly, where you lodge, I will lodge. And so in other words, if you just put me in this holding pattern, which a lot of us have been in that uh, for a long period of time, when you put me in this holding pattern, I'll wait on you. I'll, not get ahead of, I'll try not to get ahead of you. I'll try not to lag behind you. Will you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Very important step for those of us that, uh, those that were in the, in the beginning of their walk. I know probably a lot of you would have the same testimony. The Lord, when I came to the Lord, I had to leave behind a lot of people. Uh, I didn't, wasn't angry with them or whatever, but I wasn't going to go where they went and I wasn't going to do what they did. Your people, the church, will be my people. Your God will be my God. Because see, she was worshiping Chemosh. That was the worship of the land. He said, I'm going to forsake all this pagan stuff and all the practices associated with that, which are same things are happening in America and around the world right now. All the stuff, and I won't take time to go there. All of that, your God, in other words, the one true God will be, will be my God. I'll leave all these false idols and all of that. Where you die, I will die. Uh, where you die, I will die, and there is where I'll be buried. And that the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything but death parts you from me and me. In other words, I'm making a lifetime commitment to do that. And so the journey toward bridal readiness really begins when we make this, like, this level of commitment to the Lord. I'll, I'm surrendering I am surrendering my life to you. And maybe there's some here and some watching online who've never really made that level of commitment where I say I'm really surrendering my life to you. You'll not be made ready as a bride until you, put, you settle that issue with the Lord. I'm going to give my life completely and totally to you. Amen? Amen. Amen. I didn't mean this to be as heavy as it is, but anyway, this is, this is the way it's coming out. So uh, anyway, the second principle is the journey toward bridal readiness requires a believer to develop a wholehearted and intentional pursuit of Christ as our bridegroom king. I want you to hear that. This is, this is where I think a lot of really committed believers, I believe, fall short in terms of the pursuit. They may be made ready even without this, but I, I believe they don't think this way. And I believe the Lord wants to bring a correction there. It, it's that we have to focus not only on surrendering our life to Christ, but there, has, there needs to be a focus on Jesus as the bridegroom king and on ourselves making ourselves ready as his bride. 
Do you see the distinction there? One is a general thing of I surrender my life. The second is a, is a lifetime focus, alertness, attentiveness to being made ready as a bride. Because there's some different, I mean, not necessarily different issues, but there's some specific things that the Lord speaks of in the context of the bridal paradigm that he wants us to follow. And this is, this is the attitude. And, you know, there are a lot of scriptures we could go to, but uh, I won't read all of this, but I would really encourage you to read Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, 12, and 13, and look at it in the context of the pursuit of the bridal city. Because if you think about the bridal city, uh, you know, Revelation 21 and 22, the new Jerusalem... Is the, is the city that's coming down out of heaven. Christ will be at the center of it, but it's also in Revelation 21 and 22, it's spoken of as the bride. The city where Christ is at the center in some way will be the bride. It says it's, the city is a bride adorned for her husband. You, you can read it in Revelation 21 and 22. So the the the... The city is the bride, uh, the, it's, so it's the bridal city. And just well, if you, and then if you go back to Hebrews 11, 12, and 13, what you see is you see first with Abraham, he gave everything. He gave everything to pursue this bridal city. And then you see the faithful witnesses that go along. They gave it all to, to pursue this bridal city. And then the author of Hebrews says, you know, you go, you lay down every encumbrance and you go after this bridal city. So it's not only just a general laying down of our life, there is a focus on being the bride made ready. Now let's just look at a few scriptures. Uh, if you look at Hebrews 11 verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place where he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, a follow, a fellow heirs of the same promise. Verse 10, look at verse 10. For he was looking for the city which has its foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Abraham wasn't just looking for a piece of land in the Middle East. That's part of it. But somehow, somewhere, somewhere along the journey, the Lord gave him a vision, I believe, of the New Jerusalem. And what did he do? He you know, you can you read about it in the in the Old Testament. Abraham spent years wandering and he and he wasn't perfect he made mistakes he sinned uh he was weak uh he tried to work things out on his own he did all kinds of things that weren't necessarily right but he hung in there and and became the father of many nations but what was driving him was not just a piece of land in the middle east it was a city a city but it's the city was a new jerusalem he was he was trying driving him, the city was driving him. And then you look at the, you look at some of the um, faith, the cloud, a great cloud of witnesses. For those who say such things, I'll start with verse 14, 11 verse 14. For those who say such things, make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Then if you look at 11 verse 32 who by faith conquered, uh, talking about, the again, the great cloud of witnesses, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, 
quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now again, the city. And so verse Chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and let and has sat down at the right hand of the Father. I think I've got one more. And then 1222. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriads of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous men made perfect. And one more in this, uh, in this Hebrews section. This is chapter 13, verse 12. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Now, there's a lot of scriptures there. But the theme of that in the book of Hebrews is that these faithful a uh, cloud of witnesses, Abraham, and the exhortation is to us as well throughout history, live to seek this city. We're to, look, we're, to, we're to seek this city. And the city they're talking about is the New Jerusalem, the bridal city. Lay down every encumbrance. You know, none of us, I mean, they talked about being sawed in two. I mean, Raise your hand if you want to be sawed in two. I mean, I don't think, I mean, that's, it's like hopefully none of us will have to be sawed in two. Uh, yeah, um, I don't want to be sawed in two. I don't want to be tortured. Uh, you know, I don't want to be. But, but the point is we want to lay down our life in pursuit of this bridal city and the person of Christ who is the center of this bridal city to have that relationship with him whatever the cost, with a focus on the pursuit of the bride being made ready. So there's a general surrender of our life, but there's also a specific focus on making ourselves ready as a bride for Jesus. So important, so important. We need to do that. All right, amen? Amen. I've only got four more points to go, but uh, these will go quicker. These will go quicker, I promise, pretty quicker. Pretty quicker. I don't, is pretty quicker a word? I don't know. <laughs> it's close enough. Okay. Third, we're, again, we're, we're doing, we're focused on foundational pursuits or lifestyle that will help us be made ready as a bride. So we've got complete surrender of our life, focus on making ourselves ready as a bride. The third one the journey toward bridal readiness requires believers to develop a growing and deepening personal relationship with Christ, a relationship with Christ. Now, two as aspects of that that I'll talk about, seeking and abiding, seeking and abiding. Uh, now, you know, I, I'm always hesitant to, to try to, and I don't, try to come up with some sort of a, specific plan that you have to seek the Lord for several hours every day. You know, I always think of uh, the mother who's got three toddlers hanging from her leg and to try to tell them to spend hours seeking the Lord in, in quiet time or whatever it doesn't really make much sense. So, but, uh, so it, it, it varies by, by season of life and, and you know, other issues as well. But there, it's important to develop a relationship with the Lord. Uh, and this, there's two, two basic reasons why this is important in the context 
of making ourselves ready as a bride. First one is revelation. Uh, you know, you're, you're only going to really be ready as we get revel progressive revelation of Christ, of the person of Christ. Because the more we love him and understand him, the more we're going to want to follow him and give our life for him. And so revelation is really important, and that comes out of this relationship with the Lord. So we need, we need the relationship, one, to get a progressive revelation of this man that we want to fall more in love with and want to be married to. And, and you know, we, a lot of us have been walking with the Lord for decades now, and you see how, as you've done that, how much you love Christ more now than you did when you first came to him. I mean, I came to the Lord because I didn't want to go to hell. That was my main motivation. I don't know how much love was involved there. I just didn't want to go to hell. But over the years, it's changed. I still don't want to go to hell, but I want Christ. <laughs> I want him. I want this man. I love this man, Christ Jesus. So, so revelation is part of that. And then the other part of it is, and we'll go back, go back to Ruth for a second. You know, Naomi was a picture of the Holy Spirit, and she led Ruth through every station to ultimately she led him or her to be married to her kinsman redeemer. And so the Holy Spirit will lead us. Important that the Holy Spirit will lead us all throughout our life, step by step, journey by journey, to the point where we will be made ready if we'll just listen and obey. But if you don't have a relationship, a, a, an active relationship with Christ, you won't hear his voice. I mean, I think about just my own life. How many of the things that have led me, good or bad, where I am now, if I hadn't have had that relationship, because a lot of it came from that, from hearing God and obeying, you know? I mean, I was in business. I was completely happy in business. And the Lord called me into the ministry. But that wasn't in the scriptures. It was the Lord speaking that to me. And there's, you know, I could go through one step after another on this journey. But You'll never get to that point if you don't have a real relationship with the Lord, whatever that may mean for you. Uh, you know, it, it will be different, you know, for each and every one of us. So anyway, that's the third foundation. So we got surrender of our life, pursuing Christ as bridegroom, and then third one, a growing relationship. Now I'm going to go quicker on these others. Uh, number four, the journey toward bridal readiness requires a believer to accept the truths that they are loved, accepted, and righteous in the sight of God. Loved, accepted, and righteous in the sight of God. Now, Brian basically, that was basically his message, I think, from uh, the last message he preached about imputed righteousness. Because we know that our God is a holy God. He hates sin. But yet he loves us. And because of justification and imputed righteousness, when the Father, a holy God who can't look upon sin, sees us, he sees us through the shed blood of Jesus and our justification and imputed righteousness. So therefore, our God can love us. He can accept us. He can work with us. I mean, he doesn't want to leave us in our weaknesses, in our frailties. He doesn't want to leave us in our, in our sin. He wants to change us. But he can draw near to us, not because of who we are, not because of uh, anything in, in and of ourselves, because, but because of the blood of Jesus. Because uh, that 
he has imputed his life, his righteousness to us. Now, our spirit has been imparted in righteousness, but all of us has have imputed righteousness. Now, I know that's a lot of stuff that's confusing probably, but we need to accept that. We need to accept that even though I am a sinner, I am weak, I am frail, even though I am all those things, my God loves me and he accepts me even in my weaknesses because it's from, like Brian said, it's from victory that transformation comes, not for victory. Um, so anyway, that's the fourth point. The fifth point, the journey toward bridal readiness is sustained when the believer desires Christ more than the world. This is an important, this, this will be a progressive uh, issue as well. But if you look at Song of Solomon here, what, if you look at Song of Solomon, you see that the, the maiden, and this is a picture of the believer on a journey to be in maturity and love and union with her bridegroom king. Her journey begins when she say, may, says to him, may he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth for your love is better than wine. Now, she's talking as using wine as a picture of the pleasures of the world. And she says this, you know, your love is better than anything the world uh, can offer. Now, a lot of us, we didn't begin our journey, our salvation relationship there. I didn't. You know, I, and I, I still, you know, wanted the world. And then probably all of us still want parts of the world right now. But the more Christ, we want Christ more than the pleasures of the world, the more we can go on this journey. So part of that we have to just ask him, Lord, make me what I want you more than the world. The Even, and I'm not talking necessarily about sinful things. These can be good things as well. And there's not a problem, with, I don't think, with certain non-sinful worldly activities <clears throat> as long as they don't supplant or replace our love and desire for Christ. But the journey needs to be progressively where Christ becomes more and more of our life and the world less and less and less of our life. That's when we'll be made ready. And then the final one, the final point, the journey toward bridal readiness requires a believer to have faith that God will make us ready if we trust him to do it. Uh, I think this is really, really important one, especially for those of us that may have been on this journey for a while. You think, you see this, the demand of scriptures and you see your own life, and you think, man, I'll never get there. I'll never be what I need to be. It, may, it becomes almost overwhelming. But we need to believe that if we will pursue it, that Christ and his sovereignty will make us ready, that, that he is able to make us ready. I like this passage from Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not, in, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's the, the challenge to work it out. But then the next part of that, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and and to work for his good pleasure. You know, God's at work in us both to make it where we want to be made ready to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and he's working it out in us. So we have to believe that God is, that, that God is able, that, that God uh, will make us ready if we trust him to do it. Um, 
And so that's a challenge to us all probably at some time or another. But just to believe that God will do it. So I want to close the message with just a challenge for each of us to really jump on that bridal readiness journey. So important, so important. Because it's the bride made ready that will trigger the second coming. And I don't know how many people he needs for that to happen, but I know I want to be on that. I want to be in that grand processional. We missed the first one 2,000 years ago. I want to be on this next one. Amen? Do you? Yeah. All right, let's, let's stand up and let's, let's just pray. And You know, if anybody uh, here feels like, you know, maybe they need to, to really uh, surrender or fresh their life to Christ, uh, then we'll give you an opportunity to come to the front. I don't know that that would be the case or not, but I want to just pray that all of us would either start or join in on this journey of bridal readiness. Father, it's, it's our desire. I believe it's our, the desire of everybody here to be the bride, be a part of the bridal company and to be the bride made ready. We want to be, we want, we want those linen garments that allow us to minister before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, our bridegroom King, for all of eternity. Lord, I know we're looking through a, a, a glass dimly, but Lord, we know enough to know that whatever you have in store for your bride made ready, we want to be a part of it. So we ask, Father, that you would help us all to join in on that journey. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us, whether we get the notes or whether we just have taken notes or whether we just can remember these points, will allow you to deal with us in those issues, Lord. We want that, Lord. We want it, we want it, we want it. Help us all to get on that journey the bridal journey. Help us to follow Jesus as you rode that donkey into Jerusalem and as you're riding that donkey even into here. Make us ready, Lord. Make us ready. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 We'll end the uh, online portion here. I do want to give, I don't know that there's a, 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 anybody would want to respond to this or not, but I do want to give opportunity, whether it's to be born again, whether it's to uh, jump in onto that bridal preparation journey where you've not really thought of it or considered it and you want to do it, just to give an invitation to come to the front and uh, I think with a message like this, it, it deserves a, an invitation. Um, so if there's anybody who wants to either born again or really want to fresh surrender your life to that bridal journey, then I just will give you an invitation to come to the front. We won't tarry, I don't think, with, with a long period of time, but I do want to give that opportunity. So just if there's anybody, just come on to the front now and we'll pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. All right. Amen. Amen. Well, okay. Just remember the offering bucket in the back, and thank you so much uh, for your attentiveness. Great worship this morning. Thank you for uh, being here. Have a great week, and remember, no prayer this Wednesday night, and we'll see you uh, next uh, Sunday for Resurrection Sunday. All right. God bless. Okay. Bye-bye.